This is the person that's been leaving notes in your box for two days. In your box. Great. That's what you are, Michelle. Great. Are you great today? Hello. Great. I am great. I'm back in the robe. Yeah. I haven't put a brush through that hair. No, you have not put a comb or a brush near that mop for some time. I've got the boof. I've got the robe. Life is good. And welcome, all of you lovely eavesdroppers, to another episode where Michelle has really brought her A-game. It's eavesdropping. It's a podcast. I'm not Michelle. I'm Geordie. I'm nicely dressed. My hair is brushed. I'm Michelle. And you, dear listeners, you're eavesdropping on us. Congrats. Congrats. And that also makes you an eavesdropper. It does. You're an eavesdropper. And we love that. We love our eavesdroppers, don't we, Michelle? They're so gorgeous. They are so gorgeous. They write in, they send pictures, they send voice notes. We love it. We didn't hear anything about outfits apart from Yarnica, though. Do you remember we talked about clothing recently? What are you wearing? What should you be wearing? What's hot? What's not? Fashion. We love fashion, you and I. We do. And I will say I got a lovely surprise on my messages this morning from you. Some fashion from back in the day, me the 90s. Well, you've got a cigarette in your hand in oh, one gosh. photo. I never had them out of my hand or my mouth during the 90s. <laughs> I just thought, God, I forgot you smoked back then. Oh, God, all the time. And it wasn't really that long ago that I gave up. You say that, but it must be at least 15 years. 10. 10? 13, actually, because I gave up when I got pregnant with my daughter. Well done to you. I'm glad you did that. You didn't do a Courtney Love? No. No, sir. Yes, but those pictures were absolutely fantastic. There was even a very young Ben Cartel. <laughs> yes, I found Looking one stunning. of us together mm. back in the day when we were young and fresh-faced. Absolutely gorgeous. Thank you for sending those through. Maybe I'll pop one on the Patreon. Okay. Maybe the one with the Siggy because it was shocking. Well, I was thinking of using them for our social medias, Michelle, because you don't send me enough videos of yourself being ridiculous to help us promote every episode. Where are all our social media followers, by the way? I'm really lacking in likes and follows and subscribers. It's very strange. There's something with the algorithm and I don't understand it because I do the social media for the restaurant. We have these beautiful reels of the food. Absolutely gorgeous. I smashed out a reel the other night, five seconds, if that, of our gorgeous Italian chef. Oh, hot Thomas. Tommaso. Hot Tommaso. Hot Tommy. Hot Tommy. (laughs) (laughs) He's a feast for the eyes, ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you. One for all the family. Well, he is flaming hot in this video. This little reel, he's there, he's got this meat A big slab of meat. Is this the one that you got like 300 likes all of a sudden or thousands of likes overnight when normally you don't have that many? It's because of him. We are up to nearly 70,000 views on this reel. That will be because Hot Tommy got his meat out. (laughs) Georgie! (laughs) I have turned into the old lady that makes all the rude jokes and where it was cute once, I think at this age group, it's actually a bit creepy. Sorry, Hot Tommy. Uh, Hot Tommy. (laughs) Do you know what? We had a uh, Ben Affleck doppelganger in the restaurant last night. And I said to him at the end of the meal, our chef Hot Tommy thinks you look like Ben Affleck. (laughs) You didn't call him Hot Tommy though, did you? No, I didn't call him Hot Tommy. The guy said, oh, thank you. I've had that before. And he said, sadly, I've also had John Travolta. (laughs) And I said, I hope you mean young, hot John Travolta and not old, fat John Travolta. And he said, yeah, I bloody hope so too. (laughs) doppelgangers who do people say you look like well you know I always had Courtney Love throughout the 90s and I told you that I was asked to model on the front of the melody maker when she couldn't make it into the country but my band forbid it I also get Joe Wiley when I've lost weight and people young men usually come up to me and try and schmooze me because they think I can give them a leg up in the music industry and I can't or a leg over (laughs) hey who else do I get Joe Wiley, I have been told by my old drama teacher, this is when I was very young, that I looked like a young Glenn Close. I'm not sure that that is a compliment. She's beautiful in a, when she's young. What do you want about? I always thought she was a little bit manly. And you're very feminine. Perhaps I'm manly, Michelle. You think? I am. 
a hundred times bigger than you. <laughs> yeah, but Christina. everybody is. So we know about your doppelgangers. You've had the lovely Maggie Gyllenhaal and, of course, the fabulous Trudy Styler. Don't even. Don't bring that up. What's wrong with her? She's oh, gorgeous. She's not gorgeous. Look, we Michelle. all hope that when people say that we look like someone, it's the young version of them. But you, I don't ever want to clarify these things. Now, there was also somebody said I looked like... I don't remember the actress's name. Someone, Ventimiglia or something. I don't know. When I was in Thailand. And you were called Sir. I was called Sir many times. My sister was called Madam. <laughs> and I was told that by a friend's mother once, I was a handsome girl. <laughs> handsome. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? She said, well, you know, in that kind of manly, handsome way. Manly. Fuck you. I've been called Bonnie. Does that mean I'm fat? No, that means you've just got a lovely, happy face with cheeks that people want to grab. Oh, well, no one touches my face, thank you very much. Oh, it's well, very expensive face here. Oh. You know, like creams and whatnot I've got in here. Doppelgangers. I don't know who Hot Tommy would be a doppelganger of. My God. Who would he? One of, he's one of a kind, really. Ah! So piercing, those eyes. Yes, trying they to think. are. He's just like a handsome model or something. Like, who's that David Gandhi? Is it David Gandhi in the underpants with the striking blue eyes and the black yes, hair? Yes, that is David Gandhi. Yeah. Although, you know, Hot Tommy now, he has got the old bald look going on. Doesn't affect his looks one bit. He can't have it all. And actually, oh. they say that the baldies have a very high testosterone level. Do they? Which makes them quite randy, I suppose. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, here's the old lady back again. Where's my pussy cats? Where's my pearls? I'm going to clutch them. Well, as long as you've got a pussy cat and not a tribal pussy, I'm sure you'll oh, be God. fine. You're also an old creepy lady, Michelle. Why? Because I talk about the travel pussy. You can't stop. I can't stop. We have to put the travel pussy to bed. We have to. <laughs> that travel pussy has had too much airtime. Although I will say. What? One more travel pussy note, yes. Andreas will be driving. Up the autobahn in the next few weeks, he knows his mission. He knows what he's got to do. For the love of eavesdropping, he's got to buy a travel pussy. And he's got to film the unboxing <laughs> as well. That'll ah. be something for the Patreon, I think. Extra, extra, read all about Give it. Give me the scoop. Eavesdropping wind and there's no doubt about it. Eavesdropping. Now, Michelle. Last week's episode, that wonderful deep dive that you did about the boys in the bridge, so tragic. It was heartbreaking, Awful. really, that story. But we did discuss what the hot hits were in 1989. Yes, we did. <laughs> I'm not talking about that one. Do you remember I said about Billy Joel's We Didn't Start the Fire yes. that he did a new version? It was actually Fall Out Boy. Fall Out Boy. Okay. Yeah. And they did another version with naming and it's actually really good because oh, okay. that song's a fabulous song and I hate it you know I hate remakes hate remakes of songs I hate remakes of films when they're brilliant films if it's already been done once why do it better again you can't you've done it shitter usually <laughs> but this one's amazing the fallout boy version I really enjoy it Billy Joel's one was from his date of birth to 1989 all the things like moon landings and whatnot that had happened or oh, did they Chernobyl whatnot and with Fallout Boy, they then brought things that had happened. I don't know what the time frame was, but there's all sorts of things. QAnon's in there. Oh, really? Oh, okay. That sounds yes. interesting. Go and have a look. Put the link. It's going to be on the Patreon, which is where you go to get little extra bits and bops from us as a gift, <laughs> pledging money to help us to make this podcast better, bigger, whatever, and go places you'll never imagine. And once again, please... With podcasts, word of mouth is the best way to spread the word, along with giving us a like, a star, and a little comment so the authorities know you're not a bot. Authorities. Who the fuck are the authorities? Yes, please. The authoritarians. Do you know what? I, it's because I'm all up in cases. I'm always talking about the authorities. Yes, that's true. But listen, we have some exciting people that Michelle and I are going to be talking to soon. We've flicked through our address books and we've found some interesting folk in there who have agreed to being on the podcast. A little chitty chatty. Eavesdropping chitty chatty time. Mm -hmm. If you're a Patreon member, keep your eyes 
appealed for those. I have a rock and roller who has agreed to do it. Wonderful. Yep, he's agreed. You just have to become a Patreon member. Yes. And Michelle has an award-winning novelist to speak to. Yes, I do. So all coming up on the Patreon. Hopefully. Speaking of remakes in 1989, it's very unusual that we were talking about that, 1989. Mm. My husband said there's a TV show on that a friend of his, a man, recommended and he sobbed all the way through it thought it was fantastic it's also a remake okay it's one day oh do you know what i've seen the ads for that come up it does not tickle my fancy i read the book absolutely loved the book thought the book was brilliant one of my favorite books i of course sobbed all the way through reading that book right it didn't even get through 10 minutes of the film because it was so awful saw yeah. that there was a tv show coming up Mm -hmm. I don't know. I looked at it and thought, no. Well, we gave it a go. And? It was rough. I couldn't get through it, really. It was a lot of, you know, teen, not teen sex. It was a bit salt burny, but the PG version, Mm. because they're all graduating at Edinburgh University. um, And they all seem a bit, you know, it's a life. It's a life that I don't live and never did, really. Mine was a bit more university of life. But... He's agreed, the other half has agreed to give it another go. So we're going to watch episode two tonight. But it's set in 1989. Of course, with these sorts of remakes, I do think they're trying to add in all the sexy bits. And to be honest, the book wasn't really like that when I think back on it. To me, the book was more, you know, it did have a little bit of that sexy stuff in it, but it wasn't how they want to depict it, I think. So I'm not sure. Look, you give it a second go. I will. And I'll let you know what I think. And our eavesdroppers, we have a lot of great telly recs from our wonderful eavesdroppers. So if you've watched this and you have an opinion, write in. Let us know. Write in. I've got something else on the back burner, should it be a shitter. And it's called Constellation or Constellations on Apple TV. It's a science fiction with a Swedish actress who was girl in the dragon tattoo Girl under the dragon tattoo. Girl with the dragon tattoo. Uh, Thank you. So, okay, I'm just trying to think who that is. All right, well, that sounds interesting. Her name is, can't remember. She's got a very pinched face, black hair. What's her name? Is that the one that married the hot guy from... Numi. Numi Rapace. Not the one I was thinking of. I thought you meant the Swedish one who married the hot guy from 12 Years a Slave. Fassbender. Oh, yes. Alicia Vikander. Yes. No, that's not her. Okay. (laughs) Thanks for clearing that up. Great. Great. Um, did I get that right? I don't know what you're saying. Full of shit. I have a little theme to talk about today. And I'm going to start with Jodie Foster. Because we talked about her recently. And you do know that there was a massive controversy surrounding her. Not once, but twice, but three times. Three times Jodie Foster has hit the headlines. Obviously, the first time was when she played a 12-year-old sex worker in Taxi Driver, her very first, I think it was her very first film. Or maybe it wasn't. Maybe she was already doing Disney. I'm not sure. Freaky Friday and all that kind of thing. Maybe, but she was incredible in Taxi Driver. Yes, she was. And then later in life, when she collected an Academy Award, and I can't remember the dates because I'm not very good at doing research, unlike you, Michelle, she kind of came out. But not really. Yes. She did this weird kind of coming in, coming out. Everyone was suspecting it. People kind of knew. And she felt, well, fuck you. It's none of your bloody business. So she kind of said something. I can't remember all the details now. But the middle thing that happened between those two things is something much more newsworthy and intense. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about that right now. And this is from Alexandra Pollard, who wrote a story in The Independent 2021. And it was an article about what happened to Jody, because... Like I said, she played the teenage sex worker called Iris in 1975. She was age 12, Michelle. Yeah. And she was wearing like platform shoes and halter neck tops in Martin Scorsese's classic. Yeah, and I think she had those amazing love heart sunglasses, very Lolita style. Lolita. Yes. And that might even have been where that whole kind of Lolita styling came from. They really sexualized her, very much like Björn Andresen, who I spoke about a few episodes ago as well, who was in Death in Venice. But that was the role. Yes, of course. But why'd she have to be 12? Because it was the character in the, in the film was 12. Gross. 
But that's the thing. I don't think it's glamorizing. I have to remember and go back maybe and rewatch because I do remember Taxi Driver to be an amazing film and she was incredible in it. It's very dark. So Robert De Niro plays this troubled Vietnam veteran called Travis Bickle and he notices Iris, the sex worker, and after Travis Bickle had a failed... Now, spoiler alert, after Bickle's failed attempt to assassinate a presidential candidate, he then goes off in this kind of heroic manner to free Iris by shooting her pimp and is hailed as a hero. So that's the backstory of the actual movie. But truth, Michelle, is stranger than fiction because somebody who saw this film had similar feelings for Iris and in turn, the actor who played her. What? And this man was called John Hinckley Jr. He was a young man who was estranged from his family, hooked on Valium and recently kicked out of a neo-Nazi group for being too extremist, Now, which is always a worry. Is that even possible? To be in a neo-Nazi group and you're too extreme. Well, it's a good example of how extreme perhaps he was. But he recognised himself in Robert De Niro's Travis Bickle and he began to dress like him, like wearing army clothes and boots, keeping a diary just like Travis Bickle did in the film. And he was absolutely obsessed with Jodie Foster. I have a feeling this is not going to go somewhere nice. Meanwhile, Jodie has grown up a little bit and she's gone to Yale. Famously, she took a break from acting. She went to Yale in 1980 to study and she was completely unfazed by her celebrity. She turned her back on it while she got herself an education, hanging out with other students, dressing alternatively and even acting in some of the plays on campus and, you know, within the drama societies and whatnot. I think she's always tried to have... A normal life, as much as you can, being an A-list celebrity. Yeah, she's pretty down to earth, I suppose. But unbeknownst to her, John Hinckley Jr. had followed her to Yale and he began hand-delivering letters to her doorstep, which she ignored. So she already had loads of fan mail, but Hinckley's pile of poems, letters and messages all professing her love for her just seemed to get under her skin a little bit. Yeah, they probably had creep vibes. Yeah, totally. We've talked about that a lot on this podcast where people, even Madonna was like, yeah, this one guy, too far. You know, I think you have an instinct when it's going too far. Well, somehow this guy got her phone number, Michelle, (gasps) and called her. And he recorded their first telephone conversation. She says, who is this? He replies, This is the person that's been leaving notes in your box for two days. In your box. (laughs) In your box. Hang on. (laughs) I'm not quite sure that's... I don't think... That must be kind of uh, of the time. In your post box. Post box? In your post box. Good. So Foster handed Hinckley's letters over to the dean of the Yale University. But the more Jodie Foster ignored John Hinckley Jr., the more his obsession grew. And on New Year's Eve in 1981, in a recording, he said... Jodie is the only thing that matters now. Anything I might do in 1981 would be solely for Jodie Foster's sake. Oh, my God. Chilling. And this is an extreme neo-Nazi here. Yeah. He also says, I think I'd rather just see her not on earth than (gasps) being with other guys. Oh, my God. Stalker. In March 1981, John Hinckley Jr. wrote Jodie Foster one final letter. And in this one, he told her he was going to perform a historical deed that echoed the plot of the film Taxi Driver by attempting to kill President Ronald Reagan. Okay. This letter said, as you will know by now, I love you very much. I would abandon this idea of getting Reagan in a second if I could only win your heart and live out the rest of my life with you, whether it be in total obscurity or whatever. I will admit to you that the reason I'm going ahead with this attempt now is because I just cannot wait any longer to impress you. What a lot of pressure. What? So it's like, be with me or Reagan gets it. Yeah. Okay. See you later, Reagan. (laughs) I've got to do something now to make you understand in no uncertain terms that I am doing this for your sake. But John Hinckley Jr. never posted that letter, Michelle. He left it in his hotel room, walked to the Mm -hmm. Washington Hilton Hotel where President Reagan had just finished a speaking engagement and waited. When the president emerged, he shot at him six times in 1.7 seconds. The first bullet hit the White House press secretary, James Brady, and he would become permanently disabled and eventually die from his injury 33 years later. That's awful. Police officer Thomas Delahanty was the next victim, 
followed by Secret Service agent Tim McCarthy, who threw himself in the line of fire. Hinckley wow. was then wrestled to the ground and arrested, but not before the sixth and final bullet ricocheted off the president's limousine and hit him under the arm. Reagan didn't even know he'd been shot until he started coughing up blood on arrival at the hospital Fuck. minutes from death. Holy shit. I didn't know this. How? I didn't know he actually got hit. How do you not remember this? No, I didn't realize he got hit. Mm. I don't know. I was probably singing along to Culture Club. There's footage of him going down. Jodie Foster, meanwhile, was still living her best life on campus until one of her flatmates told her what had happened later that evening and who was responsible. Afterwards, she had to do press conferences, meetings with the Yale board, lawyers, FBI. It's not her fault. And there was a copycat stalker who decided against Mm. killing her because she was too pretty. All of this is going on for her. Can you believe it? Yeah. Reporters were following her everywhere. That is horrible. It's not her fault. And somehow she's been roped in just because she's famous and trying to have a normal life. Her name was mentioned. Letters were found. Recordings were found. All talking about her. And she'd reported it to the dean already, you see. Mm. So she was implicated even though she wasn't responsible. Yes. And she was completely overwhelmed by the attention. She told the press only that she planned to resume my normal life. And at the trial, when she told the court they had no relationship, he was in the courtroom and he shouted at her, I'll get you, Foster. What? Oh, no, that's horrible. That's chilling. But guess what, Michelle? Oh, what? He was found not guilty of 13 charges by reason of insanity. And he was detained in a psychiatric hospital Released in 2016 under the condition that he never contact Jodie Foster. Poor old Jodie. He's out there. Yes, but he has been rehabilitated. Mm. Poor old Jodie said, I am sorry for people who confuse love and obsession and hurt by those who have inflicted their confusion on me. Obsession is pain and a longing for something that does not exist. John Hinckley's greatest crime was the confusion of love and obsession. The trivialization of love is something I will never forgive him. His ignorance only prods me to say that he's missing a great deal. Love is blissful. Obsession is pitiful, self-indulgent. This is a lesson I've learned. I'll always be wary of people who proclaim their love for me. Yeah. I know what love is. Do they? Wow. Well, you know, Jodie Foster is interesting because she doesn't go for the easy roles. Right from the beginning in Taxi Driver, she went for these gritty hard-hitting roles. Did you ever look up this Hotel New Hampshire that I mentioned? No, I haven't. Again, this is a really tough role for her. And it starts off like it should be one of these absolutely beautiful films. It's actually based on a John Irving book. And John Irving is this fabulous writer. A little bit of his time, I think, some of his books. World According to Garp. Exactly. Yes. Cider House Rules. You know, he's written a lot of wonderful books. He wrote The Hotel New Hampshire. It was made into a film. A Prayer for Owen Meany. That was a brilliant book. Exactly. I mean, I have all of his books. I think he's a wonderful writer. I think some of his earlier themes, if you view them with the lens of today, it's a little bit maybe people will Shoot him down. I mean, he's a wonderful writer. But this particular film, Jodie Foster plays Franny. Rob Lowe is in it. Bo Bridges, Natasha Kinski, Amanda Plummer, Matthew Modine, Seth Green. It's all-star cast and it's 1984, I believe, or 85. Okay. And Well, I'll check it out. Spoiler alert, there is a very graphic rape scene in this film, which is... Aside from that, it's actually this quirky oddball family and what happens to them. It's a wonderful film from memory. But again, does it hold up? If you watch it, please let me know. All right. She does choose roles where she has to portray the uglier side of society and humanity. And, you know, I'm not surprised that people want to protect her people like she said so beautifully who've confused obsession with love Mm. and while we're on the theme of love yes i had a great story sent in by an eavesdropper ren oh wonderful who was a fabulous one for sending in fabulous stories thank you ren this was sent via the abc news this story came in 2011 and it was harking back to something that happened in may 2005 And it does relate to love and obsession. Listen to this cracker. Okay. 
46-year-old Thomas Montgomery, who was a married father of two, posted online as Marine Sniper, who he portrayed himself as being online. A young, handsome Iraq-serving Marine, of which he was no longer, on a teen chat room game site called Pogo. I don't know anything about Pogo. Do you? It was around in 2005. No. Never heard of Pogo. Pre, what do they call it these days? Snap, not Snapchat. What kind of Snapchat or the ones where you swipe right? Not Tinder, but the latest one. Everyone's oh, on what, it. Oh, what, like social dating apps? Probably around the time of MySpace. Yeah, even. 2005. Yes, possibly. Anyway, Thomas Montgomery had been in the Marines for six years as a young man and he trained as a sniper, but he never saw any action. And he was contacted. And God knows why he went on the site, but for whatever reason, he's on there pretending to be much younger, calling himself yeah, a teen. This is Marine sniper. It's got some grooming vibes. Yeah, yeah. It does sound like that. And then he was contacted by somebody with the handle tall hot blonde who was 18 years old so he pretended to be 18 as well Mm. because maybe he hadn't put the age on there at that time Mm. and his rationale was that they would never meet so let's just play a game for a bit but the flirtation turned to romance that's the thing it's very seductive I don't know if you've ever had any kind of online chat situations with people and people you've never met not really I have it can become very very intense Just because... You think you're never going to meet? Well, you can project whatever you want onto them. You think you'll never meet and you can reveal things about yourself that maybe you feel safe doing it. Mm. Certainly people I know who've also done this, it can get very intense very fast. And it feels very real. I mean, look at catfishing. But just as you've just said, Michelle, just as you've just illustrated, Michelle, over time, Tall Hot Blonde revealed that her real name was Jessie and that she was a high school senior from West Virginia. So she sent Montgomery photos that proved she was indeed what it said on the tin, a tall, hot blonde. And in some very provocative poses, let me add. Oh, my goodness. When Jesse asked to see Marine Sniper's pics, he sent her his photo from Marine Boot Camp, which is when he was 30 years younger. Okay. Cute, hotter. Before he had the kids. (laughs) He became Tommy, the younger, hotter version of himself. And he was portraying this on the site, showing himself as a strapping lad with muscles and bright red hair. Instant messages recovered from his computer show that the online relationship began to consume Montgomery. He told media outlets that it had become more real to him than real life. And Jesse appeared to feel the same way. And the pair would exchange gifts, phone calls, love letters. She told Tommy, I love you always and forever, Tommy. And Tommy would respond with, I've never felt this way before. And it was serious for these two. They were having virtual sex which apparently oh made Tommy God. feel kind of dirty. But he was so enamoured, he couldn't stop. He couldn't put a lid on it. Do you think that that was through... I mean, it couldn't have been through video because then they would realise. So it must have been like over chat. the phone or chat. And they were having virtual sex, which I imagine to be instant message sex. Mm-hmm. What year was this again? 2005. He said it was like a drug that he needed every day and couldn't give it up. He just loved it so much. His neighbours described him as a good man who worked on the board of his daughter's swimming team. And sadly for Thomas Montgomery, his life started to become fixated on his conversations online with Jesse. This is from a note that he wrote to himself. On January 2, 2006, Tom Montgomery, 46 years old, ceases to exist and is replaced by an 18-year-old battle-scarred Marine who resembled a red-headed Harrison Ford and had 2.5 million in the bank and a nine inch penis. Oh my God. Congrats. <laughs> you can be anyone you want in your mind. That's a big nine inch nail. He said he is moving to West Virginia to be with the love of his life. However, Michelle, fate caught up with him as his wife Cindy found a package that Jesse had sent to the Sunday school teacher Montgomery, which led her to his secret pile of photos, underwear and letters from West Virginia. Oh, no. Cindy took matters into her own hands. As you bloody would. So she sent a letter back to this sender with a photo of her husband and his family and said... Let me introduce you to these people. The man in the centre is Tom, my husband since 1989. 
He is 46 years old. <laughs> now, Jessie received this and she was horrified. She then sent of Montgomery course. a text the next day to end the affair. And Montgomery told ABC News, she sends me a text message and says she hates me. You should be put in jail for this. Raging with vengeance, Jessie then used the internet because she must have felt completely betrayed. So she then went on this mission to betray him back in a way. So she found a co-worker of Montgomery's called Brian Barrett, who was only 22 and was so good friends with Tom Montgomery that he was like his mentor at work. Okay. She flirted online with Barrett, who called himself Beefcake in open forums, which Montgomery could see. He watched their exchanges on open forums. Yeah, of course. And she was definitely doing that so he could She see. was trying to wind him up. So she'd goad Beefcake Barrett into humiliating Montgomery at work and online. And as passions peaked, Montgomery began making threats against both Barrett and Jesse's mother. And the messages Ooh. he sent to Jesse became increasingly unhinged and Montgomery was then embarrassed online by Barrett and Jesse when they posted his real age and pictures onto the forums and insinuated that he was a paedophile. Well, so they're really going for it. I don't know that he's a paedophile, but it's borderline grooming stuff here because he deliberately misled her. So, I mean, not that anybody should be kind of named and shamed, but that's what's happening here. So at this stage, Tom Montgomery is... Absolutely yeah. raging and full of vengeance and hatred and embarrassment. He tips over into an uncontrollable rage when he overheard Brian telling co-workers that tall, hot blonde had chosen Beefcake Brian to pop her cherry. <gasps> oh, my God. That was the final straw. I mean, okay, that's quite gross. On. And she's a manipulator. Look at what she's doing. At this point, he was behaving in an increasingly threatening and violent manner and sent a message to Jesse saying, Brian will pay in blood. (gasps) Fucking hell. And when Tom Montgomery heard Brian Barrett was about to visit Jesse in West Virginia, he was beside himself. So on September 15th, 2006, Montgomery drove to meet Barrett as he left work okay. at their shared workplace and shot Brian Barrett three times with his sniper rifle, killing him. Fuck. Well, that's his life over. Shot him dead. That's his yeah. life over. Well, both of them. Both. Both of their lives over. And all this is over a girl that neither of them had ever met. And that's what I mean about Jodie Foster's comments, getting love and obsession confused. Real life. Real life. True crime. True crime. I want to know about this Jessie. Is she who she says she is? Well, I can tell you a bit more about Jessie now because obviously the police... Got involved, yeah. The police got involved. They seized computers of Montgomery's. They realised he was, they were both talking to this Jessie. They needed to backtrack and get to the bottom of who she was and where she was from. So they discovered this spider's web of intrigue and deception with the internet love triangle and they located Jessie and went out to West Virginia to investigate. And when they arrived at Jessie's address, they were greeted by her mother, 45-year-old Mary Sheila. And when they explained to Mary what had happened involving Jessie, and they desperately needed to speak to her, Mary Sheila broke down in tears and confessed to them that she had been masquerading as her own daughter to deceive Montgomery and Barrett. Oh, my God. It was the mum. The mum all along. Do you know what? It's so strange because you feel like if she just revealed her true colours, because obviously she's lonely. A man died. Yes, a man died. But it could have all been avoided if she just said, hey, I'm actually a 45-year-old mum. This is my daughter. This is me. We've both lied. Maybe there's something here. The feelings were real regardless. But was it? I just don't understand. I can't get to the bottom of what was going on in her mind. And Jessie, her daughter, her real daughter, whose real photos were being sent to this man, had no idea her mother was using her as catfish bait. Of course not, because you would just be mortified that your mother would do this to you. For sure. Terrible. By all accounts, Mary, at the time, with the exchanges going on, 
was just thrilled with all the attention she got as Jessie yeah. and took more pictures of Jessie while she wasn't looking. <gasps> she had pictures of her daughter lifeguarding at the pool that she'd post. She had pictures of her getting into the car where she'd be flashing a bit too much flesh every now and again. Mm-mm. And it wasn't just Barrett and Montgomery that she was posting <gasps> to. No, she's... There was loads of other guys. Oh, fuck. So she had just basically taken on her daughter's identity online. That's terrible. To get attention. The lengths that she went to are the sort of things that most parents would be absolutely, totally against. Of course. Nowadays. They wouldn't allow pictures of their children on, you know, school newsletters. Yet Mary is going as far as pulling out silk red g-strings from her daughter's washing basket dirty washing oh my God. and posting them she's posted used underwear to not one but two but three men at least yeah that's disgusting do you know what i will say in the early 2000s when you know the idea of instant messenger had not been around that long it'd probably been around 5 maybe 6 years and it was a slow burn but once people started realizing the immediacy and the intimacy that could be achieved through instant messaging. I actually think it does something to your brain. It creates a different kind of connection in your brain. It is addictive. More intense. It Well, it's an addiction. It changes something. And, you know, there's all of these articles saying the reasons why you should never let your kids use an iPad Mm-hmm. it's because it changes the wiring. And I think when instant messaging first kind of, you know, spread across the world, there was no clue that these wonderful new invention of just having the immediacy of instant chat could actually have these harmful effects. And I think that this is part of that. I'm going to do some research. I'm going to put some links in the Patreon. Back me up. Okay, great. I wish that I had done more research on this because I often hear the millennials in my life, the younger folk, Mm. talking about instant messaging and chat rooms and things, it's something that kind of passed me by. Well, it didn't for me. I was really right up in it. It, I was one of the early adopters. Who were you chatting to? Boys. Boys. Right back in the kind of 2000, I was like hot on the the IMs. IMs. I'm just going to drop him an IM. He's going to (laughs) slide into my instant messages. Is that what they'd say? And it was through AIM and all of these other things. There was Skype messaging and it was very new at the time. And I I loved it. You know, it does lead you to do crazy things that maybe you wouldn't normally do Mm. because, like I said, the intensity of it, it's full on. It's very full on. And I think this whole early 2000s, people never having that kind of experience before. Yeah creating something this very addictive sensation and you just want more 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 and like he said he ceased to exist and suddenly he became this other person yeah no idea he was being catfished back as well in return the double the catfisher gets catfished absolutely but I, I guess it's just not for everyone is it and you're not to know until you get too deep in I don't even know what possessed him to go on there he's a married man yeah well, maybe it was his thing because he was a Sunday school teacher. Just saying. Oh, Geordie. I don't know. I don't know. But listen, basically, the police did catch up with Montgomery for the murder of Barrett and they built up a really strong case against him. They had his DNA at the crime scene. They had a family photo which showed the gun which he used to kill 22-year-old Brian Barrett. And during the trial, he pleaded guilty to Brian Barrett's murder and was sentenced to 20 years in prison. Meanwhile, the prosecutors in New York were trying to find something that they could pin on Mary Sheila. Yeah. But ultimately, she hadn't really broken any laws. That's not that she was complicit in this murder in any way. It was just her actions had kind of propelled someone who was capable of pulling a trigger. So really, how do you blame her for that? Well, she was manipulating. I mean, she obviously did not foresee the effects of what she was doing and that a man would lose his life. Yeah. But surely she could be done for stealing her daughter's identity. I mean, that's identity theft and fraud. Is it fraud? I don't know if identity theft was a thing then. I think, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. I don't really know. And it's the early days of the internet here where 
I think a lot of the ethics... Or at least social messaging. Social messaging. Social forums and whatnot. That's true. Yeah. I think the ethics around around it was still being formulated. You know, it's so in its infancy at that point. Well, she said in her defence... Mm that she was keeping Montgomery online so that he couldn't talk to other teenagers. Fighting the good fight there, Mary. Bullshit. I mean, that's very easy to say in retrospect. In retrospect. Oh, I'm out there trying to catch all these creepers. But actually, she's the creepiest of them all. She's the creeper. Yeah, she's a creeper. She never apologised to her daughter. She wonders still why (gasps) uh, her daughter has never forgiven her. No, she... She lost her whole family in one go. Her husband divorced her. Her daughter doesn't speak Good. to her anymore. I think outside the court, she said, when are you going to get over this? It wasn't even remorseful. So perhaps there was some sort of sociopathy going on for her. I, I don't know. I'm not her doctor. But there is a documentary, if you want to know more, called Tall Hot Blonde. And that came out in 2009. And it was directed by journalist Barbara Schroeder, which goes into all the, the details of their infatuation the deceit the violence and the three families that were destroyed by what was initially described as a bit of fun yep barbara schroeder seems to think that despite montgomery displaying rage issues mary continued to encourage the behaviors it's poking the bear isn't it poke 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 push 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 yeah i think schroeder's take was that she is complicit she is partially to blame somehow Mm, it's just figuring out via the letter of the law how. Mm. And they obviously couldn't. Well, they couldn't. No. There's also another, it's a movie, like a television movie on Lifetime that Courtney Cox directed and had a small part in that was out in 2012, also based on this story with a couple of fictional characters thrown in called Tall Hot Blonde. So there's lots of extra deep diving if you'd like to go ahead and look at that. But I had a little another route around the internet just to see if there was any kind of information as to why a mother would do this to their daughter. And one other thing that I found, which didn't have too much detail and it was more recent, was something that happened in 2022. A Michigan mother, Michigan, I always say it wrong, Michigan mother. Michigan. That was charged after harassing her daughter online and her daughter's boyfriend what under a fake online profile yeah she basically directed hate mail to her daughter and her daughter's boyfriend to the point where these children these kids were absolutely beside themselves they were being trolled terrified and traumatized yes. oh my god and the weird thing was so the, the mother was called kendra gale Lakari, and she was 42 at the time she was working alongside the boy's mother and the school officials to work out who it was to try and get to the bottom of it. So she was on board in the investigations, hiding in plain sight. This is classic. Yes, classic hiding in plain sight. You know, mm. when murderers get on board and... You see them in the background on the in the press conferences. Join the search for the missing body. She started sending horrible messages to the pair in 2021 and she would use virtual private networks, VPNs, to hide her location, even making it look like the messages were coming from other teenagers' areas and using all the lingo. Because I don't know if you know, but teens use a certain lingo. I can't decipher it. It's all capital letters and you think, oh, they've spelt that wrong. But actually it all stands for words. So they must have just a very limited vocabulary where they right. say TTFN. Not that, obviously, <laughs> because that's old school. TTFN, which stands for Tata for now. now. I mean, who says that? <laughs> Thanks, Granny. <laughs> Two to then. See you next Tuesday. So it's not those ones that I know. It's other... IRL. We all know that. More up to date ones like IRL. I think even that's dated. Oh, it is. That's like definitely 10 years old. <laughs> so, anyway, eventually, this woman who had sent 349 pages of harassing texts <gasps> and social media messages. God knows why. I couldn't find out why. She was eventually caught, made a full confession, and even now they don't know what the reasons behind it for these hateful messages were. Was she not into the relationship? Did she want her daughter to end it with this boy, maybe? I don't know, because I haven't seen the messages and I looked everywhere. I couldn't find it. don't know the nature of it, apart from that it was hateful and her daughter was beside herself, plus the boy was beside himself, the parents apart from the one that was perpetrating, were all up in arms. As a parent, could you ever imagine doing any of this to your kids? This is the thing. I have a teenage daughter 
And she's very beautiful. And I find it horrifying to think of anybody treating her that way, especially her own mother. The betrayal, the emotional pain that would cause that young person. There's no coming back from that, especially when in the case of Tall Hot Blonde, this woman was going to where her daughter worked to take candid photos so she could use them. Oh, she even took a picture up her skirt and sent it to the men and said, how'd you like this, boys? Oh, my God. Do you believe it? I, 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 you can hear in my voice, I am outraged of the suburbs. It's really quite psychotic behaviour. Mm. But also, I think it points to the levels of obsession and what people will do to keep this online life going and they get deeper and deeper into it without thinking of the real life consequences yeah. you know losing your daughter losing your family a man got killed to me mary sheila i mean i don't know the woman and i haven't seen the documentaries full disclosure as you like to say michelle <laughs> but i feel like it was the attention that drove her she wasn't looking or feeling her best anymore and perhaps that was the driving force. And then it was the length she went to and then the lack of remorse afterwards and the way she spoke to her daughter, like, why aren't you over this yet? God, get over it. Yeah. That just made me think that there is some sort of narcissistic behavior, like a, a personality disorder at play there. I would agree for sure. Wow. www.eavesdropinpodcast.com Hello at eavesdroppingpodcast.com Email us a story Share, like, all of that Follow our social media Like, subscribe Instagram and Facebook Yep, you know what to do At eavesdropping underscore You yep, got that right eavesdropping Like I said, people can get deep very fast into this, you know, instant messaging back mm. in the days when it was all very new. But as we know from Catfish and all the stories we've done previously on this podcast, it's still happening. It's still going on. People get sucked in. They get reeled in. They don't need anything more than their emotions and they don't realize they're being emotionally manipulated and guess what else, Michelle? We are living in an era of loneliness because probably because of the internet, you know, it connects people, but equally it isolates people as well. It does. And the anxiety that a lot of people have just been left with after two years of lockdown on and off, and especially the young people, they're retreating into their bedrooms. They're, they're craving contact and what's the word I'm looking for? Connection. Connection, thank you. Connection. So they use the internet for that. Yeah. And then suddenly fantasy takes over because you're not having real world experiences and interactions. So then this can cause a bit of um, dissonance, I suppose. Yeah. For you as a person and especially a young person as well. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, I remember talking to a young person, like being surprised that they were on Tinder and whatnot. And yeah. I just thought, gosh, you know, when we were that age, we were just getting pissed at parties, house parties. Yeah. And that's where you met people. It was groups of friends who knew groups of friends. And before long, it became one massive group of friends. Yep. And you were all going all around everywhere, going to all these different parties with kids from all different schools and colleges. And you were all congregating. And then, oh, he's cute in the corner. And you neck that bottle of cheap wine. and Neck. Oh. Yeah, you neck that bottle of cheap wine and then you end up like pashing. I thought you were going to say you were necking with the young man. Necking? No, I was pashing. necking the bottle of wine. I was drinking that down, <laughs> chugging it down. Chugging that handsome girl in the corner, chugging down a bottle of, what's it called, Blue Nun and then oh. pashing the nearest <laughs> chap at the uni bar. Dr. Lindemans. <laughs> yeah. Dr. Lindemans. <laughs> Sucking on a goon. Is that what they called them? Goon, Guna, Guna bag. What were they called? The silver things inside the boxes of white wine. Absolutely disgusting. Yeah, well, that's the thing. You know, you just get the box wines, bag in box. What was the bag inside called? Isn't it called a Guna? It wasn't a Goonie. A Goonie or a Guna? I can't a remember. Goonie. Guys, Australians, please help us remember our 80s lingo. Yes, parties. That's how you met people. That's how you, yeah. you passed them. But these days, where do they go? What do they do? 
I don't know. Well, it's also because we all moved out of home very young and that gives you a whole freedom, freedom that you don't have when you're 24 years old and living with your parents and you can't really have some absolute fucking raging ridiculous party where the police come five times because the parents would not (laughs) allow that so it is a different cultural climate for sure true i don't know which is better our teenage years or the current ones i just don't know it's hard to compare because we're not that age now but i will say looking back i absolutely loved that i'd moved out of home early i loved being in charge of my own time and yeah. eating chocolate cake for breakfast because <laughs> I want to. It's what every young person dreams of, isn't it? That level of freedom and autonomy over your own decisions in your own life. Yeah. And having that very young, and I think you have to mature very fast, but also you have those years where you just don't give a fuck and mm. you just have fun. You do. It was a great time. Do you know, just quickly, I want to go back to, I want to just touch on Married at First Sight Australia, which I am thoroughly enjoying. I am waiting until we are face-to-face in person. Well, I'm not going to do a big catch-up with you. I've seen it all. You've got to do the catch-up. I'll dip in. I'll dip in. Dip right in because you need to catch up and get to know all the married couples. What I was going to say about that is, yes, they have paired sometimes on explosive TV, but occasionally you do see why they've paired these two people. And in a way, I really like the experiment Because you're throwing two people in. They both are ready, apparently, to have a relationship. That's the prerequisite. Mm -hmm. I want to meet and marry someone. Or I haven't had a relationship for five years and I've got baggage and I want to meet someone. And they pair them up. There's a couple who are, one girl's lost her partner, who she's known since high school, tragically. Oh. And the other guy has been bullied all his adolescence and childhood. And he's got his baggage. And when he finally opened up to her and they they understood each other, it was a beautiful moment. I I am so invested emotionally in this TV show. And I love the older couple, not the oldest couple. Okay. The next one down, which is the man who has lost all his family as well with Lucinda, who I spoke about recently. She is the creatrix who is very sexual being. She's asked him to a four-day turn trick retreat and he said, absolutely not. <laughs> you know, they haven't even really gone there yet. Yeah. But it's a slow burn and she's a patient woman. Okay. I love it. I really want it to work out for them. Is it a slow burn or is it they're just friends? Well, it's hard to know because of the editing. But I think yes. they have a great banter between the two of them. And when they did their matching values experiment they both put good conversation at the top which was a tick right. tick for both of them and she pushes him outside his comfort zone but i think he fucking needs that timothy and lucinda their names are my face oh i will have to check it out and lucinda's wardrobe is bang on i tell you what she's got some great outfits oh well i definitely have to watch just for the fashion <laughs> Wow. Well, look, this episode, I've got telly wrecks. I've got stalker stories. Yes. Obsession, murder, ticked all the boxes. Tick those boxes. Drama, love, passion, red, dirty underpants. Deception. A lot of deception. It's all there. Thank you so much for those amazing stories, Geordie. Well, thanks to Ren for sending that one along to me. And, of course, to Jodie Foster, whose life is just laid out on the internet. You can find anything you want to know out about her. Yes. Poor girl. Okay. Interesting. Might even do that today because we are pretty much snowed in. Oh, how exciting. It is exciting and cosy. I'm going to put my Netflix fire on. Oh, lovely. I hope you've got enough um, crackers and dips in for a day in front of the TV. Oh, I have to raid the sweets cupboard and see what's in there. We might have some Grissini, some Grissini in there, <laughs> <Yeah. it>, some <laughs> salsa. <laughs> might be about the extent of it. Well, listen, Michelle, it's been wonderful talking to you again as per. And for you eavesdroppers, I hope you enjoyed the story. There's more to come next week because we're a weekly storytelling comedy podcast. All for you. But I think we've reached that point where, honestly, Geordie, there's only yes. three things to say. And those three things might be wherever you are. Or whatever you do. Just Just keep keep eavesdropping.